Okay, we have a question about the practice logic quiz, specifically four and five. So let's pull up the quiz. Let's look at the solutions page. And four and five are questions where you are asked to look at an argument and then determine whether or not the various options are correct applications of the counterexample method, even though the question says, understand counterexamples, let's just review the method anyway. So what is a counterexample? Well, it's an example that demonstrates that an argument is invalid, but perhaps we should be more specific. What kind of example would do that? Let's look at the definition of validity. So one of them happens to be up here. So all three of these are characterizations of validity, but the last one is especially good when it comes to the counterexample method. So if an argument is valid, that means it's impossible for the premises to be true and the conclusion false. So if you can identify an example wherein the premises are true and the conclusion is false, that shows you it's not impossible and that therefore the argument is invalid. And so that is essentially what the counterexample method is. Try to find a counterexample, an example in which the premises are true and the conclusion is false. If you can find one, you have shown that the argument is invalid. Now let's look at question four. Before we reason through the various options, let's just look at it intuitively. Okay, everyone who owns a yacht can afford donuts. Steve can afford donuts, therefore Steve owns a yacht. Our question is, does the conclusion follow from these premises? Is this a valid argument? In other words, is it the case that it would be impossible for these two premises to be true and yet the conclusion be false? Or can we find an example where these are true and yet this is false, which would show it's not valid? Let's replace Steve with your own name. Then it will be much easier because the actual world is basically a counterexample to this, right? So everyone who owns a yacht can afford donuts. Barring any weird scenarios where someone is dirt poor yet inherited a yacht and whatever the case may be. So maybe in the actual world, this isn't true. Let's assume a world that's pretty dang close to the actual world. And let's just assume for the sake of argument that everyone who owns a yacht can indeed afford donuts. And you, I assume, can afford donuts. Even if money is tight, you can get them half price at Ralph's later in the evening. Okay, now probably you don't own a yacht. Maybe some of you do, this is San Diego, there is a harbor, but statistically speaking, probably most of you don't own a yacht. I certainly don't, I would be a counterexample to this. So in the real world, or at least close to it, it could be true that everyone who owns a yacht can afford donuts and that you can afford donuts but you don't have a yacht. So the conclusion doesn't follow from these premises. Now, are any of these similar applications of the counterexample method? Okay, what exactly was our question here? So for four, I thought it would be none of the above because the scenarios brought in new information. There's nothing wrong with bringing in new information. Any example, no matter how weird, no matter how many details you add, any example wherein the premises are both true and the conclusion is false would be a counterexample. And that's what this one does. It comes up with one that 
oversimplifies the world. So there aren't any weird cases of people inheriting yachts, but being super poor and not, not technically being able to get a hold of some dough. Let's just clean that up and imagine a very specific world, one that only has three people in it. These three people, Yasmin, Tripp, and Steve. Now, assume in this world with only three people that two of them have a yacht and both of those people can afford donuts. I've just made premise one true. Everyone in my world owns a yacht, who owns a yacht can afford donuts. Um, and Steve doesn't own a yacht. Right, so the two people who own yachts can afford donuts. Now there's a third person, Steve, who doesn't own a yacht, but he can afford donuts too. So I just made premise two true. And because I said he doesn't own a yacht, I made the conclusion false. Since this scenario seems totally possible because it's just an oversimplification of the actual world, it shows that it's possible these premises could be true and the conclusion is false, which shows that the argument is invalid. This is a correct application of the counterexample method. Let's look at the other ones as well, since they contain common mistakes. I'm going to ignore the details of the scenario and just look at what was supposed to be shown. In this scenario, both premises are false and the conclusion is true, thus it's possible to have false premises and a true conclusion, which makes it invalid. That's not true. You can have a valid argument with false premises and a true conclusion. And showing this has nothing to do with showing an argument is valid or invalid. We're only interested in one thing. Is it possible the premises could be true and the conclusion is false? We're trying to rule out a possibility. Validity rules out the possibility that the premises could be true and the conclusion false. Okay, C. In this scenario, the premises and conclusion are all true. Thus, it's possible that all of it could be true. They're, thus, it's a valid argument. We're not looking for a case where the premises and conclusion are all true. Here's another case where the premises and conclusion are all true. The sky is blue, the grass is green, therefore I have a cat. All of those are true, or at least they very easily could be, but that is not a good argument because we don't know anything about the relationship between the premises and the conclusion. What we're trying to do is rule out the possibility of true premises and a false conclusion, and that's it. Okay, so the answer is A. What was the other part of the question? In five, I thought it would be A, but this is the one where it was none of the above. So let's look at five. Everyone who can afford donuts owns a yacht. Now, first thing you might be thinking is, that's not true. Indeed, it's not. But we aren't interested in whether the premises and conclusion are actually true. We want to know if these premises were true, does the conclusion follow? Would the conclusion have to be true? To put it another way, is it possible these two premises could be true and yet this conclusion could be false? And let's try to think about it intuitively. So assume this is true. Assume for the sake of argument, everyone who can afford donuts does own a yacht. That means you. Uh, so you can afford donuts. Well, if this is true and you do have the ability to purchase donuts, then it follows that you own a yacht. I wonder if you can see that intuitively. If not, we're developing methods for proving it, but this is valid, which means that we won't be able to come up with any counterexample that thereby demonstrates the argument is invalid. So the ones that conclude thus this is an invalid argument aren't gonna be right, and so they must have gone wrong in their reasoning somewhere. So let's look at the two that conclude it's invalid and see where their reasoning went wrong. A. Imagine a scenario such that not everyone who can afford donuts owns a yacht. That immediately is a problem because we're looking for a scenario where the premises are true. But this is a scenario where the premise isn't true. So this is not relevant at all. I don't care about scenarios where the premises aren't true. I want to know what follows if they are true. So A is not right. Okay, let's look at C. Imagine a scenario such that Steve can afford donuts even though he doesn't own a yacht. Okay, so can afford donuts, that's true, good. Doesn't own a yacht, that's false. 
We're halfway there. We're looking for a case where the premises are true and the conclusion is false. We made two true and three false. So the rest of the counterexample needs to make one false. So Steve can afford donuts even though he doesn't own a yacht. Since yachts are significantly more expensive than donuts, that's true. And not everyone who can afford a yacht actually goes out and buys one. I'm not following this. This is an actual answer somebody gave once roughly. Um, and it's not really in the ballpark of applying the counterexample method. I think the idea is that so Steve doesn't have a yacht and not everyone who can afford donuts or even yachts for that matter actually gets a yacht. So that seems to be making premise one false again. Everyone who can afford donuts owns a yacht. None of this makes that true. And a counterexample is one where we make these true and this false. And if we can do that, then it's invalid. But this one, no matter how hard you try, you're not going to be able to come up with an example where these are both true and this one's false. And if you think you can, you've probably not kept both premises true. So this is going to be none of the above. It's a valid argument and neither of these, well, I guess we didn't rule out B, which is concluding that it is a valid argument. Let's quick do that. So B asks us to imagine a scenario Steve is the only person in the world, okay. He can afford donuts, okay, that's true. Premise two is true. Steve owns a yacht, okay, the conclusion is true. We're not looking for a case where the premise and the conclusion are true. And if he's the only person in the world, then it follows that everyone who can afford donuts owns a yacht. So this is another case where we've come up with a possibility where the premises and conclusion are all true, but that is not what it takes to show an argument is valid, as previously discussed. Okay, hopefully this helps to think about these tricky counterexample cases.